Now that's what essentially, I don't know your life story or your educational background or anything, but with the other interviews at any rate, I, I always like them to start off just by saying who they are and when they were born and where they were from, sort of that sort of piece. But, so I don't, ha I, I don't have a set of questions, but anyways, I actually don't follow that piece with that sort of format because when I do oral histories, I feel that the story is your story and mm -hmm. that you're the one who has ownership of that. So that it's, it's you that decides which are the important pieces that you, or the pieces that you want to share. So, um, but even less this time, I have fewer <laughs> themes even that I've just, all I've got down, written down is Park and the Gerstein. So, so if you want to just start off with saying, uh, Willie, are you ready to go? Yep. Okay. So, um, just by stating your name and, and that the sort of background, basic background stuff, and then we can just go from there. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, my name is Paul Quinn, and uh, I had a, I guess, educationally a bit of a mixed background. I was at Ryerson for a while with business admin, and I was at Teachers College for a bit, uh, and then went to University of Windsor, where I got a, a Bachelor of Arts in... Uh, sociology, psychology. Uh, after that, I went skiing for a year and uh, started looking for work and started working with kids at Blue Ridge Children's Hospital. And, and what? Year, and sorry, what year was that? That would have been, let me think back, about '74, I guess. So, were you born in? Born in 1948. 48. Okay, in Toronto. In Toronto. In Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. Okay, so in '74 you were at Blue Ridge. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and started working there with kids that were physically disabled and uh, in the recreation department there was working with kids. Uh, I guess that's when I sort of saw that kids were able, not disabled. And uh, one of the things I worked with them on was uh, the wheelchair athletics, wheelchair Olympics, and got them to two of the kids, one of whom was 15, one of whom was 16, and got them to go to the... Uh, Canada Games. They won the Ontario Games and then they went to the Canada Games. So I got to go with them and help train and coach them. And then is when I realized uh, in training them, I had absolutely no idea how to push a wheelchair or how to do it athletically. And we got a guy in who had been a wheelchair athlete and he was the person who was doing most of the training and, and I just sort of followed his instructions. And so that was sort of how I got to working with disabled and you know, sort of seeing that it was more important that um, they take control of what's happening and uh, doing, you know, it's, my job was to get them to a point where they took care of themselves and uh, didn't need me anymore, didn't need anyone else helping them because they could do it themselves. So that's sort of the first real job I had. Um, and I went, I was at Sick Kids for a little bit just as a transition and then I started working at Park in 1981. Uh, so I worked uh, there because it was social rec, and I had seen a couple of articles in the paper about a woman by the name of Pat Capone, who was about to start a uh, a protest movement where people would go into the stores and take food if uh, they like, didn't get more money, and it was it was mostly uh, I think bombast. Um, she was just she said it you know press and it and McLean's picked it up and. Uh, so I started working there and found out that she was part of that organization or was, had been part of it. So it was a, a good fit. And uh, that so was 1981. In, in 81, so how long had Park been around when you... One year. One year. It so you were... been there. Right. So why don't you just tell me about what Park was like in the, when you arrived there. Just describe it. Tell me about the people. Well, my interview was the most interesting piece. Uh, I walked in after the drop-in had closed. And at that point in time... Uh, Everyone could smoke within the drop-in, so there was probably 100 people in there who had been chain-smoking all afternoon. And the air was literally that blue haze of smoke as you walked in. And uh, these, it was, uh, was in March, I guess it was March, uh, and uh, there were um, three women there to interview from the board, and so I just it was just a fascinating sort of place and uh, it was a, an interesting interview because it was just a conversation it wasn't really a lot of questions or a lot of things about background it was just more looking for a fit and I thought it was a really good going to be a really good interesting place to work my parents have been born in Parkdale and raised there so 
and all my aunts and uncles lived around there, so I knew the area really well. And uh, it, uh, well, it frightened some people, it didn't frighten me. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting thing to go into a place that had been the lakeside pool hall and bowling alley, which is now park, and it's where my parents used to go when they were kids on dates. So it was kind of a neat thing. That's a totally neat thing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then after that I started just working and there was very few staff back then. There would be four of us working in the, the whole of park and uh, at any given time there would be two on who would be watching the, um, the drop-in center. There was one person who did finance mostly and then um, a director. And uh, that's who, sort of... Who was the director then? Uh, Mary Stern back then. She was the director of the place. And uh, so Karen Jovier and myself were actually the ones who were, were running the drop-in center and uh, we would do the morning stuff, get everything ready for the afternoon when people would come in and we'd take turns working evenings and there was one of us working every evening in the evenings. We would work Wednesday nights, Friday nights and Saturdays and there would only be one of us on. Um, I think my third week there I was working uh, a dance on a f Saturday night by myself with probably 150, 160 people in there. So I had to rely on a lot of the people that were members, which they still have to. Uh, I think Gord Bailey was there, who's, uh, I think he died about six or seven years ago. But Gord ran the coffee, and Gord knew everything. And he had been in the psychiatric institutions most of his life. He had been sent to um, Oak Ridges at one point in time because he stole some sheets from somewhere at Whitby Psych Hospital and so they punished him by sending him to Oak Ridges. So he, uh, he but he was the guy that you depended on to tell you what to do and what needed to get done and so really all I had to do was sort of oversee what was happening and uh, the members themselves really took care of the place. So it was that nice feel to it. It was like a, it was a community and I think everyone that was there and some of them are still there from when I used to work there. Um, so who are, some of the, who are the, some of the people that were there? It, just because it would be good for me to flag them, like yeah. the old timers for part. Well, David Moore is still hanging around. Um, I'm not sure if Utah is still there. Um, who else was there? There's Barbara, who lives upstairs, native woman. She was hanging around pretty much from the beginning. Uh, a number of them, a large number of them, a, a surprisingly large number of them, have are no longer with us. They uh, passed on. I think part of the reality of poverty um, and mental health and medication and all the rest of it, who knows what all of the effects are, but they, their lifespan is not quite as long as one would hope. Um, so, yeah, most of them are gone. There's a, there's a few hanging around that I still see when I go back. Um, what else is there? Um, Ruth Sisson, she was hanging around, or her kids were hanging around then. And she's, she's still there. Um, so can you tell me about, so, the, sorry, was that your first job working with people with mental health issues? It's so my first job, yeah. I had a cousin who had uh, been in Lakeshore Psych Hospital, so I had visited him when I was younger, and he had always come and visited us as well, so we, we knew him very well. Um, and he's still, as far as I know, living in a boarding home somewhere in Parkdale. Right. Yeah. So, um, so w what was it like to go and work in a place like that? It was fun. They were good people. I mean, they were, they were, they were, it was relationships, right? So you're talking to, to real people with real problems and you can help them with it and you could laugh and you could joke and you could have some fun uh, at the same time that there's issues that have to be dealt with. And that was, for me, that was great. Um, it was the people that were, were the most important part of it, the members of the center that were there and that were invested in it and invested in each other and would take care of staff really a, a lot of times they would somebody would come in and they'd give you a nudge and watch that guy um, and uh, you know if things got out of hand we could deal with it 
I remember sitting down with a group of people that came in. We called them the Leather Feather Group. They were sort of pseudo motorcycle gang guys. They wanted to look like they were in a motorcycle gang, but they never ever had a motorcycle, I'm sure, in their entire life. But they had that tough look, scared a lot of people away. Um, but I think when you actually sat down and talked to them, when we described, you know, this place isn't for you if you're that capable. This is for other people, and if you're dominating and you're creating problems, we're going to throw you out, and you're not going to be able to stay here. They immediately changed uh, and sort of started helping out more and started showing a little more respect for individuals that were coming in uh, who were more disabled and had trouble. So they saw it as their place, they saw it as a community, and they saw the members of the community as being a very mixed group. And how, how, did that, that. how did that happen? In I mean, Park seems special, right? So. How did that sense of community, how was it created there? I think it has a lot to do, I mean, shortly after I started there, a year later, a couple of people left and uh, Patrick Boney started working there. And I think it's, uh, we didn't put ourselves as staff as above the people that were working there. We felt we were part of them as the same as their place and we are just there helping them make it their place. If we had work to do, um, we would hire uh, park members to be part of that. We painted the whole place once and we got money from the government to do that. So we tried to figure out a way that we could make sure that we had everyone who was capable of doing it coming and wanted to, to be part of the painting crew. And so we all worked side by side doing the painting and painted the whole place top to bottom. Um, and the money that we got from the ministry that we, we had an estimate from professional painters and we sent that into the ministry and then we used that money to hire park members. And Park still does that to this day. They hire members to do a variety of different things around there, have work crews, have uh, work projects. So I mean that's sort of stayed as part of uh, its core values. Right. And so what was the administrative structure of Park when you started? <laughs> when I started there was Mary Stern who was executive director or whatever her title, official title was, and uh, there was one person who did uh, the financial piece of it, um, secretarial kind of thing. So there was a board? Up. There was a board of directors, uh, a community board. There weren't, uh, at that time, there weren't members of the center or uh, people that actually used it on the board. That changed. We changed that fairly quickly to get uh, at least half the board were uh, people that used the center, members of the center and they voted for their, uh, their representatives. And the other half was community members, so people that we could find from the community that would be able to help us out at various times. With for instance? Uh, financial pieces, maybe someone who worked at um, Queen Street Mental Health Center at the time, who would be able to help us with if we had issues with them. So usually somebody from our choice sat on it. Um, so we, we had a number of different people, and it, it varied over the years who was there, who wasn't, but I think it was always sort of people that were committed to helping um, the members of Park. Joyce Lane was on it for a while, um, so it was, it was good that way. And I think the fact that the members were the majority of the board uh, and that they elected their own representatives made some interesting board meetings, but it was certainly, uh, you know, it was ownership and people really wanted to be on and they gave speeches to get on, and I'm sure they still do, to, to get elected. Right, and to be a member of PARC, you just have to be there, right? Show up. We, we have, uh, the ministry, I guess when I first started there, we had a, one of the first, sort of, my interaction with Ministry of Health people. The, uh, the ministry rep came in and said that PARC was too accessible. And we're all sitting there looking at each other going, what? It's, it's storefront, there's a front door, people can walk in. Isn't that what you want? Um, but no, they didn't, they didn't see it. And it took a while before people actually, some people from the ministry would see it. They would walk in, the um, consultants, and they'd walk in the front door and there would be an open drop-in and stuff would be going on. And you could see the fear in their eyes. This was just alien to them, they couldn't handle it, they couldn't, couldn't manage it. Um, and every so often you run into somebody who had absolutely no problem with it and would come in and would look at what was going on. That this was a community of people that were, um, otherwise they'd be wandering the streets, they'd be stuck in the coffee shops, they'd be, you know, 
especially in the winter, they get kicked out of various places. So this was a place they could be, and they could be around people that were they knew and were friends with, um, and be safe. And you said uh, a few minutes ago, you said that the members would look out for you, and yeah. look out for each other. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the look out for each other piece of it? Well, I think part of it is that. You know, if there were problems with a rooming house or the problem with a boarding home, they'd warn people against going there. There would be, um, I think, just sharing of information uh, about what they knew about living on the streets and uh, the kinds of, of things that, to watch out for. Um, you know, if there were people out there that were predators, that were, you know, there was always somebody uh, who would be looking to take their money away from their, their 50 cents for coffee or whatever they had on them or their cigarettes or whatever else and they would be like just letting each other know that that's not safe. Um, there were some funny stories, there were some funny things. I remember one guy who was uh, uh, sold marijuana, that was sort of how his business was. He came into the middle of the drop-in center one day and he took out all his bag of marijuana, put it on a table about like this and started to put it in little baggies. And we had to go over to him and say, no, this isn't a good place to do that. He went, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> maybe not. And put it all away, and then off he went back to some place where we was going to divide it all up. But they felt that comfortable there, that it was their place and they were safe. Um, and that someone wasn't going to be coming in and barging in. And there, there were a few times people did. We had a uh, boarding home operator barging once to drag somebody out because he had smoked marijuana in his boarding home, and he was really mad at him. And we had the police show up once um, because somebody had called to say there was somebody with a gun in there. And so they came in with their guns behind their back as they were wandering and looking into the drop-in. And how did you, how, what, what was the response to? Well, the boarding hall operator was pretty easy. We just sort of told him he had to leave. And we got in his way and made sure that he was walked out the door. He was not happy about it. Um, but he left. And for the uh, the police, well, there's not much you can do outside of sort of try to say, you know, we know who these guys are, we'll talk to them and see uh, if there's anything. Um, so. Because it seems to me that um, thinking about park, that it that it's 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 a, a couple of different things. It, to me, it's like it, it's a, what an asylum really should be, in, in that it's, it's it's it works as a. I mean, you said safe place. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, in a sense, then it has to be a safe place because then you couldn't let people come in and harass the members or... Yeah, I think it's ex acceptance of differences. I mean, the people would be walking, pacing up and down and, and talking to themselves and, and that's okay. I mean, people would sort of let that, they just move out of the way and get out of the way and go about their business. So it was like they accepted differences uh, and they were used to those kinds of behaviors so it wasn't something that would... It didn't phase them. They could recognize when somebody was getting to a point where maybe they were a little bit dangerous to other people. But for the most part, it wasn't. I mean, they, they were not really dangerous people. They're, they're people that mostly are victims and yeah. uh, are going to get picked on when they leave the place. So this is a place where they could at least relax a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, um, t has, so you stayed at Park Till... From 89. So 81 eight to years. 80, 8 years. Yeah. And can you characterize the membership? Do, you know, like did the membership change over that period? or Because I, my impression is male when I walk in there. I don't see a lot of women, but already you've actually mentioned two women mem members. There's a number of women members, or female members, who were there for, uh, have been there a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a difficult place for women to work and for women to be. Uh, there's a lot of guys looking for dates. Uh, and everyone who comes in there is, is potential, and they're not always, they're pretty blunt in terms of what they're looking for, the guys. So I think that's frightening to a lot of women. I know uh, I had, uh, not just women, but men, uh, say that they would come to park for a hot time uh, because it was there was action going on. There was always stuff happening at park as compared to some other drop-ins where it was a little more structured and regulated. Um, you know, places like Sound Times, which 
as, um, as smaller. Yeah, it doesn't have the big as, space, does it? It doesn't have that big space. Um, and, and sometimes it's relatively new, too, compared to Park. Uh, when, park when I was at Park, there was only a couple of other drop-ins, and most of them were organized by places like uh, uh, um, CRCT had won a couple of little drop-in places and programs one night a week. The park was all it was at that time it was community resource consultants of Toronto and now it's community uh, resource connections Toronto um, and it had a drop-in center in a community center uh, downtown and that's sort of where people would go and once a week uh, um, to get together so people people that were part of the case management team or program and then they would show up there that would be their their place to go. Archway would have a drop-in, um, but their drop-in was usually scheduled around uh, their medication injections. Uh, so they would have, they called it dark night at times. Uh, so they would come in and that would be what they would be there for. So it was very structured, whereas Park was not. You could come in whenever you wanted, whenever it was open. Um, and you could pretty much do what you wanted uh, within reason. There were lots of stories before I got there of uh, women going in and setting up shop in the back, uh, to apply their trade, um, among other things that were going on back there. So I mean, it was you had to keep an eye on it, but it was people would always let you know what was going on. So. Right, right, and and uh, did did you give out meds? No. So you weren't connected with the medicalized Absolutely not. aspect. No, no, um, no, and, and in fact, I think that what we saw a lot of was was people would be over medicated a lot and, and come in pretty stoned on prescription meds. So it was we didn't really deal that much with it. We sort of dealt with individuals if they didn't like their meds, if they had problems with it, we would try and figure out you know what the side effects were and what they might be able to do about it and try and help them strategize around how to deal with their doctor about mm -hmm. getting the meds cut back and, and look at it that way. So, and, and so often people would be in, in off their meds for a long time and as long as their behavior was okay and they weren't putting anyone else at risk, then that was fine. Right. So. And um, what was I thinking? So what, what was the relationship, like how has the relationship between Park and what I still think of as 999 Queen Street, but yeah. now KMH. But, and then maybe that shifted over time too. But I'm just wondering about the relationship between Park and other um, mental health agencies, institutions, groups. Has know. changed over the years? Or just. When, yeah. when we were there, when I was there, it was um, we would have somebody come in who we felt needed to get to hospital and we would talk to them about it, but you, you could always tell who was going to get accepted and who wasn't. Uh, if somebody was potentially violent, they may not get accepted at, at, uh, at Queen Street um, because they would be too hard to handle within the institution or if their behavior, you know, if they were diagnosed as a personality disorder, for example, that was like the kiss of death, you certainly weren't going to get service many places. And uh, I think it was frustrating for us, uh, here you had somebody who may have been on the streets and was going to be on the streets and it was the middle of winter and the only place you could get them to was either a hostel where they would be um, in trouble because uh, they would be the low person on the totem pole or into uh, Queen Street because um, the general hospitals wouldn't take them but Queen Street might, they occasionally would take people um, hotel admissions, that's what they would sometimes call it, so a place to stay for a night or two. And that's all they would really need uh, to get over that particular situation. So I think it was frustrating for us. We'd be closing down at 9 o'clock on a Friday night, or, and here are these guys going nowhere, um, not knowing what's going to happen to them. Um, so. so obviously Park didn't stay with four, member, four staff. It grew. I mean, it seems like it's got so many different things happening now. Yeah, I think once, I, when I left, um, there was five staff in total, so, and we worked as a collective. We had moved from the hierarchy to a collective, uh, so that we worked together, all of us shared all different responsibilities within that. Um, 
I took some of the financial responsibilities on. Um, Pat and David Littman were doing some of the community pieces, and um, the other staff that were there were doing uh, different different parts of it. You know, making sure the drop-in was there, and all of us would work the drop-in at various times, so it was shared. And it was a pretty close group. I think that was uh, that that was a really good piece because nobody I mean, there was always problems with authority. Uh, Everyone has problems with authority, but uh, Mary Stern was particularly tough to deal with when she had her mindset on something, and uh, Pat Caponi was working there too, also was pretty tough to deal with when she had her mindset. So in trying to get that balance and, and do what we needed to do. So being a collective meant that people, the park could move forward uh, in a political sense. Uh, so when did you become a collective? Uh, it would have been, I think, I'm trying to think of when Mary left, probably about 80 or four. She left a couple of years after I started. So, yeah. Once she left, we just decided that that was the route we wanted to take, even did, though the ministry didn't like that. Did no, and the government it would no. just drive the government. It did. Because who's who's signs? Who's in charge? Who's in charge? Well, we just let them know who's in charge for finances, who's in charge for other things. So they had two people to deal with, really, in the yeah. collective. Um, and so, did the when you say the collective? So, did the members and the staff just make that kind of decision the together? The staff made the decision. No. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And tell me about programming. It was... Like, really what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started there, it was, we had bingo one night a week. We had, uh, oh, what do we have, cribbage tournaments and uh, euchre tournaments, those kinds of things. So those things would be on in the evening. Uh, during the day, it was uh, pretty general, and they had a pool table there, which was sort of the center of uh, various uh, activity. Um, so there was, there was, those are the kinds of things, and then just basically TV and watching and talking to people, and we would do uh, outings and take people out to different places, try to get them to uh, places that were were relatively cheap to get to. So, like, um, like if you could get to the museum and you could get passes for the museum or different things like that. So things that were free or nearly free in the city, and just sort of showing them what's around, so when they can. They had time. They could do different things. Uh, we'd go on hikes through the parks and things like that, and um, that kind of stuff. I mean, just various things. I think more uh, the programming was more for the staff, so the staff would feel like they're doing something than it was for the people that were were coming in and using the center. And so we would you know, part of it was directed by by staff, but we got a lot of things going that the members wanted to. So they had uh, they wanted some group stuff done. So we did some so some group stuff was arranged. Like group stuff. Uh, like uh, there was a, a woman's group where they could talk about a variety of issues. Children's Aid was one of the biggies that they wanted to talk about. So that was sort of set up uh, for a while. And that kind of things, you know, small group things. That, that it did. did um, I think earlier on we talked about children coming. That some of the women had their children with them at the at the park. There were times that happened. Um, it, sort of, the children had to be in control of the parents. Uh, we had one incident where um, a child lifted up her dress in front of the guy that was there, and the friends of the mother of the child decided that this guy was going to abuse the child, and then they took him, beat the crap out of him. Um, not right then and there, but shortly thereafter we found out, uh, and he was just really psychotic. I mean, he just, he wasn't, I don't think he even knew what was going on, and he didn't do anything to ask this girl to do anything. But the parents just weren't paying any attention to where she was, so we said no kids after that, unless they're infants. And even then, here you have this smoke-filled room with babies, and is that healthy? Well, they're going to be in a smoke-filled room in their apartment, so probably better that the parents get out and not be angry with each other than than that. So we had to sort of compromise some of our middle-class values and uh, let them stay. But kids, little kids, it just wasn't safe. Um, my kids were there when they were young. I, you know, we, uh, my wife was working part-time, and so I would bring my daughter in when she was two and three into the park in the morning and then she'd come and pick them up at noon or one uh, as soon as she finished work and so I would be 
there with my, my daughter in the park, dropping as everything, everyone's coming in and the whole crowd's there. She got to know everybody there. And she still comes in here every Christmas, or our Christmas, we have Christmas open house here. And so my daughter and my son both come and help serve the food and all that stuff. So they're still involved that way. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so I'm just trying to think of what else I want to ask you about. I guess I want to know more about the members and their stories. <coughs> and because to me, park is such it, it, it's such a piece of the bigger story of deinstitutionalization, right? That that yeah. a place like park exists because of those policy changes of you know, supposedly putting people a, into the community. It's a lot cheaper than having an institution. They, I guess it was, before Park started, there was a, a local initiative, some ALIP grant yeah. uh, in the seven, late 70s that um, a couple of uh, the women who wound up being on Park board and founding members of Park had run uh, for a couple of, for a summer or something like that. They had a, a grant to do this sort of drop-in across from Queen Street Mental Health Center. And they, uh, that was about the same time that the deinstitutionalizing stuff was happening in the sort of the 70s, as they started to feel the medication would manage people in the community. And that's also the same time all those sleazy boarding homes started opening up and um, taking advantage of people being on ODSP and being able to collect their money off them for rent. So there were, I don't know, probably seven or eight really crummy landlords uh, that we knew of in, in that area. And uh, so people were discharged from the hospital and being placed in these rooming houses, boarding homes, with uh, landlords or, or not even landlords, they're people that ran them that would take full advantage of them. Um, there was one guy who, um, the name was Hector, and uh, he's, he's gone, fortunately, but he had a boarding home that was just horrible. It had like 30 or 40 different uh, uh, orders against it to fix it up, and basically he just told the hospital that, uh, well, there's 45 people here, I'll send them back. Um, so what do I care? And they let let him operate. I mean, they just didn't close him down because they didn't know what to do with the people once they did. Um, he would take money off them, off people that were there for various things, and they would never see their check. They would never see their even their their spending money from the check at the end of the day. And he, you know, he was one of of several that did different kinds of things. Just ripping off the. Well, there was a. Yeah. There was a woman whose mother died and she got an inheritance of thirty or forty thousand dollars from the sale of the mother's house and the woman who was her uh, her landlord who ran the boarding home said he she would take care of the money for her and not to worry about it i'll take care of that and soon after that the home that she was in got renovated and turned into apartments and then was sold for a profit and this woman just took everybody from that boarding home, all 60 of them, found another one that she rented and moved them down there with their garbage bags in hand uh, of all their belongings to the next boarding home. And this woman never saw any of that money, ever. And what about the like living conditions in those boarding houses? Do you want to, because it's, 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 a, it's a piece of the history of deinstitutionalization, right? Well, I don't know, have you read Pat's book? I've read Pat's book. Yeah, well, that, that was one of the better ones. Uh, that boarding home that she was that she was in, um, and I think that some of them were were a lot worse. There, uh, the ones that I managed to get into with people helping them move or doing something with them, um, they were seldom. There was no fresh paint anywhere. They were filthy. Um, lights there were hardly any lights in any of the hallways. Doors didn't necessarily lock. Uh, holes in the walls. Um, signs of things where pe things had been burnt, um, so no repairs were ever done on any of them. You could walk by the outside and you'd, you'd know that this was a boarding home of some kind because it was just falling apart. Three, four people in a room, um, a room this size, you'd fit three easily, maybe four. Um, and food, well, you know, you got a bologna sandwich for lunch, that was good. It was probably, you know, 
very dry bologna and old bread. So there wasn't much in terms of that. So it was just all about getting medications for people and keeping them calm so that you could take their money off. And, and so you, you actually um, advocated for park members in going to boarding houses to get them out of situations or those sort of... If they came to us, we would help them, yeah. If they decided they didn't want to stay in a boarding home somewhere, we would, we would do what we could to move them, move people in my car uh, from one place to the next to get them to a different, a better place. And they weren't always much better. Um, but they had no money. I mean, what are you going to get? I mean, in, in Toronto today... You have no money in your psych patient. Yeah. Yeah. Add that into it. Yeah. So do you remember a particular... Um, incident like there's a particular story of uh, bad housing kind of s s stick in your head, you know, in your memory. Of, I mean, you mentioned Hector's yeah. place, but another time, another time when you went to a place and tried to help somebody. Or well, I, I can remember one guy who uh, he was a park member. And he was actually pretty able. He had been acting as a sort of a super of a building. And uh, he had left his stuff there for, and decided to leave this building. I wasn't quite sure why, but he asked me if I would give my hand and go down in the afternoon to, to pick up some stuff that he had left there. So I went into the building with him, and he was in the basement. And this was a, it looked from the outside like not a bad little apartment building. But when you got in, you realized that it was just sort of a, a rabbit warren of rooms. Uh, so you'd go in this narrow thing, and there's rooms all up and down, and you know, None of them were apartments as such. They were probably just um, a room with a bathroom and not much, not very big. And uh, he went to get all his, his stuff belonging out of the, the building. And uh, as he got his stuff, this guy came along that was uh, clearly prison history uh, and a big guy. And he said, you've made long distance calls on my phone. And to, to this guy. And uh, the guy said, no, I didn't make any long distance. Well, you have a key to the apartment because you were acting as the super. You're the only one who could have made those long distance calls. And he said, no, I didn't do it. And this guy came up to him and grabbed him by the throat to the point where he was, you could see his face. And as I started to go towards to say, you know what, let him go. I'll, I've got some money. I'll give you the money for the, for the phone. Two other guys came out from behind me who were saying, yeah, wouldn't take these guys. I'm going, okay, what have I got myself into? But the guy said, how much you got? And I said, I got, I got 40 bucks. Will that cover it? He said, yeah, that'll cover it. So we let him down, and I gave him the 40 bucks. We grabbed his bags of stuff, and we left. But if I hadn't been there, and I hadn't had the 20 or 40 bucks, I don't know what would have happened to him. He would probably be, well, he wouldn't have been dead, but he would have been beaten up pretty badly uh, for a couple of dollars. And what about women in those boarding houses? Mm. Well, the women at Hector's, it was some of them that got taken advantage of sexually by Hector. And he would uh, pay them for whatever sex he got. And then he would add that onto their bill at the end of the month and take it back. So they were, I mean, that was pretty common for him. And there are other stories that I'm, you know, who knows whether they're true or not, but of kinds of things he had done. Um, but because they had mental health issues, they wouldn't be credible witnesses, and police wouldn't act or do anything about it. And I think that's one of the things that still still happens. Uh, a woman with mental health issues goes into a hospital and claiming rape, and it's the question marks go up for whether it happened or didn't happen. And, you know, legitimately so sometimes, and but at other times not. Um, so it's it's just they're incredibly vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, what? Park was was a safe place for these for vulnerable people. Yeah. Yeah. Still is. But you, yeah, and but you and you, you know, they, their stories must have become their lives were must have been so much become so much part of your life too. You know, I mean, it's quite and your kids being there and then you going to their to where they live to try to help them. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's felt it. It wasn't a family, but it felt like these were your friends that you were helping out. I mean, it wasn't like, uh, I don't think it ever felt like you were a worker and your job was to, to help these people. It was because you didn't have to. I mean, I didn't have to leave the center. I could have just you know, 
and bingo every Wednesday night and that's it. Um, but you couldn't do that with, with people that you got to know and like. You couldn't let that happen. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a, a part of what makes Park special is because of that egalitarian aspect. It, you know, it became much more, much more just people helping people than you, you being the expert or you being the. Well, I didn't take. I didn't take. I didn't get a BSW. I took a general arts degree, so I didn't have all those sort of rules in your head about what you're supposed to do as a, as a social worker. So I didn't have any of that. All I had in my head was these are people that are that I'm getting to know and they're friends and uh, what can I do to help. So that's you know so you come from that perspective. You come from a a human perspective when you're dealing with them um, and and working you know. Gord was Gord was my euchre buddy. Man, we would win every time we were, were partners. We would we would win. And it was a group of guys that played bridge that always needed a fourth for bridge. So you'd sit down and you'd play bridge with them and you'd be talking about their lives and what they're doing and all that and at the same time you're doing that kind of thing. So it's casual, like you would with your friends. You know, that's where the conversations take place and that's where you find out about them and, and what's going on. Um, some funny guys. Richard Marlett was a guy. He was a gay man who lived in boarding homes. Was Richard was uh, uh, Gord's friend. They'd been friends for years. And Had they been in the institution together? Yeah, they were in Lakeshore Psych. Right, so Lake. they knew each other from the institution. And into the community. Mm -hmm. And Richard was a, a great artist. I think there's some pictures of his that he did while he was at Park there. He would do, he, he had a really good eye, but he had no, he couldn't sit there at a canvas and draw something. He had to have someone tell him what to draw, and then he would be able to go and, and do it. And there was someone who came into the Park who did uh, art with him, and he did this beautiful painting. And he had done it, and the, all the person had done is say, well, try this, or try that, and, and then off he went, and he did the painting. But he would, he took off one year and he decided he was going to go on a, a journey. And so he hitchhiked across Canada. And now this is a guy, skinny, uh, really bad teeth, uh, disheveled. I mean, he would wear a suit, but it was very old and all dirty. And he would, he took off and hitchhiked all the way up to the Yukon. Uh, and he got up into the Yukon after months of hitchhiking across Canada with no money, nothing. I mean, he's ODSP, so all it's gone, it's been spent. And I uh, well, we remember getting a call, wanting to know if we knew him. And so, yeah, we know him. <laughs> Somehow they got Park's number. And uh, they said, well, he's up here. I said, well, he lives here. And he says, well, how's he going to get back? I, said, I don't know. How are you going to get him back? Well, they sent him back by plane. They paid for a plane ticket and got him back to Toronto. So he got this nice trip, got to see all of Canada, got up to the Yukon, <laughs> and they flew him home. <laughs> so, I didn't think there's anything yeah. okay. So, so what, but, um, what was the, like how long had he been in Lakeshore then? Do you know? Well, I don't know. Um, I know my cousin went in when he was about 16, 17, off and on for years, and he knew, he knew Gord and they knew him. So, I mean, it's, it's like uh, probably a lot of them when they were in their late teens, early 20s, for whatever reason, and you don't know. I mean, it, and then they were just there. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and sometimes for pretty minimal yeah. reasons. Yeah. And then they were just there. And then when they... That was um, their home. And then, did they, so you know what, I don't know the, I'm not an Ontario historian, so I don't know exactly when Lakeshore closed. Did they show close entirely? Uh, I think it did it in stages. When Park opened in 80, I know they went to Lakeshore Psych and they went to the basement uh, underneath all the buildings there were sort of like a whole mesh of hallways and tunnels and things where they kept all their old furniture and stuff. So Park was furnished by the old leftover stuff from Lakeshore Psych. So mm. it would have been closed in, in the 80s. Uh, I like that. Symbolism of moving the furniture from the institution actually yeah. out into the community, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> into the old. Did you say it was a bingo hall and a pool hall, or sorry, bowling, a bowling alley. alley? Bowling alley pool. Actually, we discovered where the uh, the pool hall was in the basement, and and the bowling alley was on the main floor. And we discovered that because when we took down some of the paint from one of the the pillars that was going across, and one of the beams was going across, it said, "Don't step over the foul line." If you go upstairs at park. 
and you go into some of the, the hallways, you'll see the, the uh, wood from the bowling alleys is used for the floors. So those, like the lanes, those little thin strips, there are the four floors up there, and you see the pin markers every so often, little circles where the pin's supposed to be. So they, that's it's still there. I still have it there, but anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, so can you tell, I think, I think I'd love to hear if you have more stories about the members and that, because the piece, the piece that interests me is that movement yeah. out into the community, and then how do you, how do you create your life? Well, one of the things you've been saying that's really interesting is you sometimes hang out with the same guys you were mm -hmm. in the institution with. Yeah. But can you, do you have more, more stories for me? Well, I can talk to you. Well, there, there's one woman who I still am in contact with. Uh, Irene was the first person I met there, one of the first people I met there. And I remember meeting and talking to her, and uh, she was telling me all about her life and what's going on and uh, how she had, uh, she'd been run down by a street car and uh, she'd been shot by the police and all this stuff. And she said, I, I, I shot by the police. She said, yeah, right here, right on my back, right between my wings. And I go, okay. Well, she meant shoulder blades, right? <laughs> That's what she called her shoulder blades were her wings. But she had lived in and out of shelters that whole time, so she's one year older than me, so she's, at that point in time, she would have been 34, 35, but she had spent most of her adult life in shelters. And she, had she been institutionalized before She had been that? institutionalized, she was one of the ones that was institutionalized at uh, Edgar Holmes, uh, which for developmentally delayed adults, mm -hmm. so she'd been in that whole institutional thing where a lot of people that have both mental health and developmental disabilities wind up. Um, so for years she'd been there and then she got sent out into the community. And when she was in the community she was living in, in various shelters, Nellies and Women's Reds and all the ones that are around still. And uh, had various times shaved her head and let her hair grow. And, um, she would be delusional talking about people living in her couch and that kind of thing. And uh, we got to know her over the years and helped her move from a boarding home into an apartment. And uh, David Littman, who was working at Park at the time, myself moved her and we lifted up her couch to move it. And David was really funny. He looked at Irene and said, Jesus, this couch is really heavy. Can't you get that guy to live and get out of that couch so we can move it? And she just giggled so hard. It was funny. Um, but then she wound up getting into it. She had a really good worker and she got into decent housing. She was a uh, Toronto Community Housing Corp building. And then um, now she's living up in, uh, in Collingwood. And I still I talk to her probably once a week, she calls. And uh, go up and visit once in a while and help her move up there. So. Mm. Oh, that's, that's a good story, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah she's, uh, she's doing okay. She's 63 now and uh, her health isn't great, but uh, you know see what happens over the years. So do, do you want to, um, I, I know we've got to talk about the Gerstein, but but um, but I wondered if you wanted to talk about, if, if you wanted to share any more difficult stories, because I was reading, when I was trying to find information about you on, I, I read Scott Sim, Simmy's piece, which is, mm -hmm. he, which he obviously talked to you mm -hmm. when he wrote that. Um, um, the piece that is his story, and then is Edmund Yu's story, and do you do you want to talk about Edmund? Because it, obviously he was a part of your time. He was here. At, he was here. He wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't at. No. Okay. No, he was. Uh, he was referred by Park. Uh, Bob Rhodes referred him here. They had uh, found. Um, I mean, he, he had contacted Edmund because Edmund lived right next door to uh, to Park at the time, in the building that Park now owns, and yes. it's going to make good. Yes. Um, and he, he was on the streets and he was in trouble and uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't survive in a shelter. He was staying in some of the, out of the colds and they were not, not good. So Bob got him here to stay. And he was staying here, um, he'd only been here a couple of days. So he'd come in and he wouldn't stay in his room because the room didn't have, the door didn't have a lock on it. He didn't feel safe in a room without a door with a lock on it. And uh, you know, he had started a fire in the bath, in the, the sink in the room he was in. It was safe, it was in the sink, and it was just part of his ritual thing he did. And he started to cook all kinds of food on the barbecue. He had a big fire in the barbecue because of the food he was cooking. He said, 
do not use a barbecue. But he was, while he was here, he was a little bit, you know, he would do karate moves with people in the house. And what you could see is the people that, are, that were staying here were not the least bit afraid of him. I mean, he would do, and he would do a karate kick, like this far from your face, and stop his foot there. And that would be his, you know, he was showing you how to do this. This is how you do it. And uh, the people weren't the least bit afraid of him or, or concerned about him. And, and staff here realized that this was a guy we were going to have to spend a lot of time working with. Um, he was somebody who was going to come in and out, and we were going to have to sort of make it as easy for him to get in and out as possible. So he didn't have to make a phone call or someone didn't have to refer him. If he showed up, we would find a place for him and we would keep him here. He left uh, one afternoon and headed down towards uh, the lake. And uh, we found out the next day that he had been shot by the police. Mm -hmm. So he had, uh, he was fine with us. I mean, he was not, you know, he wasn't middle class or anything like that. He was a guy that was a little bit strange behavior, but was otherwise not unusual for, for people we would have to stay here. And he was typical of someone who was homeless, who had trouble being in a place with four walls and other people and uh, so we were going to work with them for a long time and um, it was pretty devastating for, for a number of staff who had in a few days gotten close to him. Um, yeah, yeah. You know. No, it sounds like he was really pretty special. Yeah, I mean I didn't, I talked to him once while he was here and I think uh, you know, he's got staff that he knows that, that he had met and here and then I come in in the daytime on, on my, sh you know, I come in around nine. And I saw him in the, in the kitchen, and as I walked by, I said hi, and didn't know who he was. Um, and he just looked at me like, okay, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? Um, and then a couple of days later, he was dead. Yeah. And so we had to testify at the inquest, and one of the staff that got to know him also testified, and she has mental health issues herself, or had in the past, and, mm -hmm. and issues with the police in the past as well. So it was uh, tough for her. Do you see a shift with the police since that? You know, you see a shift every so often in the police brass in terms of what they think is what should be done, but in the frontline cops, not a whole bunch. You know, I think we have had good experiences with them, I have to say, mostly. Um, but they still don't want to hear about mental health issues. They still don't want to have to deal with it if they can avoid it, even though, you know, they are the ones who really have to deal with the tough situations. Um, and we work with them as much as we can. We can go up and we do training with them and we work with their uh, mobile crisis teams to try and get things, just try and make things a little smoother so that they can get people to us quicker rather than take them to jail. And we also have mental health and justice money. So we have another site on Bloor Street for people that have mental health issues and are in conflict with the law. So that's been really good too. Um, able to get people in there and keep them for 30 or 40 days and help them find housing, which surprisingly keeps people out of trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a safe place. Yeah. yeah. So do you, um, do you want to talk about when you left Park? Did you leave Park and come to the Gerstein? Yeah. So yeah. that's 89? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about, oh, wait a minute, before we leave Park, you do, you got to tell me about when Bob Rose comes, or does Bob come when you leave? Bob was a case manager at, uh, now I'm trying to think of when he came, whether he came before I left or after. I think he came after, because he was on the board of Park, and he was case manager at Archway, so we, we were interacting all the time. Um, so he was, uh, he was a case manager, but you could tell that that wasn't, you know, that wasn't, that structure wasn't him. Uh, it was fine while uh, I think Ann Harris was there and was the, in charge of it. He was okay with that, but she got fired because she didn't necessarily agree with uh, the, you know, uh, Queen Street and the hierarchies there. Uh, she allowed her staff to do different things. Uh, Virginia Royer would go out and work with uh, pregnant teens, even though they may not, may or may not have had mental health issues. But she saw that in Park Hill, and she was so she was working with them, and Anne would let that kind of thing happen because it's part of the community. And uh, Bob would, I think, fought against a lot of the, the rules and regulations, and uh, then he came over to Park after I think it was just after I left, because right. I was still on the board there. So we, you know, I was on the board for four years after I left, so I didn't leave Park. Right, right. No, when I met. Bob, I thought, um, a social worker, 
that's gone over to the other side. <laughs> and then I, and I was trying to figure out Victor the whole time. I just thought, no, not social work. Where does he come from? And then he told me after this theater. So I thought, yeah. of course, much better. Um, okay, so you came to, so you were there till 89. Yeah. And then how, um, how did it work out that you came to the Gerstein? Well, it, I, I guess I realized at that point that, I, that sort of I'd reached my limit at Park in terms of, uh, you know, did I want to stay there forever or not? And no, no, I didn't. Um, I want to stay in the field somewhere. And this job was coming up. Um, and they were really having trouble finding someone with a community sense that also knew the Ministry of Health and new finances. So and I applied for the job along with uh, a woman who worked at the Ministry of had worked at the Ministry of Health, uh, Barbara Fichette. So we applied as co-directors, sort of knowing each other a little bit from when she was a consultant at Park. And I thought that we could probably work together as co-directors. And so we sort of went in as a bit of a team, um, not necessarily take the two of us or don't, but as if we were to get that job as co-directors, we could work together. And Mary Lou McFedrin was keen on having co-directors. Um, she was part of the, the hiring committee. So we applied for the job when we got it. Um, and it's a bit scary because the expectations of the Gerstein Center were that it was going to resolve all the problems, all the mental health issues, and all the crisis issues in all of Toronto. Uh, this one? This one little building. <laughs> these, this one van with two staff in it going out into the community and a, a house with two staff in it dealing with 10 people at a time was going to solve all the mental health problems in the Toronto. And uh, there was a lot of questioning in terms of whether if you don't have doctors and nurses and you don't have medication, how can you possibly do anything to help anyone? Um, got asked on a radio, I was interviewed on the radio and they asked if we are going to have uh, nurses and doctors going out with needles to get people injections in the community. And I said, well, no, we're not going to do that. I said, well, what good are you going to be anyway? And I said, well, we'll find out. Um, so basically what we took was what, how Park was dealing with people and sort of treating people as people when they're dealing with them and they're in crisis and talking to them about what the, what this, rather than what their diagnosis is, why they feel like they're in trouble now and what can we do to help you. And if we can't help you, who can? And how can we get you to those people that can give you the help that you need? And just keep it straightforward, practical, concrete, and work that way. And it, and it, in the beginning, the hospitals didn't want to see us coming in. The hospitals didn't want anything to do with us. But very quickly, after about two or three years, um, the hospitals are some of our biggest fans. And so they realize that this is a resource that they need. For a lot of times when people come in who don't need to be hospitalized, don't need to get extra medication, and just need a place to be to be safe for a few days while they sort through their crisis and figure out what they're going to do next. And that's uh, sort of what we've become, and that's worked. So were you the first, the, did the Gerstein Center open in 89 then? It opened, well, we hired uh, a number of people uh, in the summer of 89, mm -hmm. and then we started operating a mobile team, just the mobile team, in the fall of 89, and we actually opened in February of 1990, the 10 beds. We actually had people breaking into the house to get in before we were open, so. A high demand, yeah. There is. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell, just because we're interviewing you, can you um, talk a little bit about the philosophy and and the, the history of the Gerstein Center? Well, it comes out of the, the Mayor's Action Task Force report on discharge psychiatric patients for the City of Toronto, and that was done and finished in 1984. And so in 82 to 84, uh, Rio Gerstein and a group of people that she pulled together went around and looked at what was what they felt was required uh, once people got discharged from psychiatric hospitals for them to live safely in the community. And it had 27 different recommendations, everything from coordination of services to case management to work to housing to, uh, um, I guess, finances, all those things. And uh, one of them was for a Toronto crisis house. In the original report, it looked very medical model. I had talked about having a psychiatrist and nurses and all that stuff on, on staff, but um, the group that was um, 
it's more or less a steering committee to try and push those uh, report through. Um, felt that it didn't have to duplicate hospitals. There was already enough hospitals downtown Toronto. You didn't need to have a mini hospital in the community. They wanted to try something different. There was an alternative to hospital when either people didn't want hospital or didn't need it. And so that's sort of what we became. So we're not... Who was on that steering committee? Um, there would have been... It was Reva. There were representatives from uh, Queen Street Mental Health Centre. There was... I think Mary Lou McFedrin stayed on it for a while. Um, who else? Pat Capone. Um, Liz Jansen, who's just retiring from public health. Um, and a couple of other people I can't remember. Mm -hmm. There's about eight or ten. What, what do you think? Um, why do you think the shift from the report to what actually unfolded? I think a lot of it had to do with uh, the fact that there was no. I mean, there was really no need to duplicate a hospital. And they went and looked at a couple of other places that were basically started because of the report. Um, there was three places in Montreal uh, that that started crisis houses based on the Gerstein report, and they were really not very nice. Um, they took all the nicest space and they put that for staff offices, and they created a separate large space for a doctor's office, and then they had all the people who were staying there in crisis and sharing or three or four people to a room in the back, much like boarding homes. Uh, their rationale for that was that they're going to go back into the boarding home, why should we give them someplace too nice uh, um, while they're staying here? Let's, you know, make it so that they can be comfortable and we can help them, but then we'll, you know, from there on we'll get them back to where they need to go. They had, when you walked in the front door, there was the almost like a nursing station with all the people who were staying there's names, all their medication, when their doses were coming, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, the Reba was particularly pushing not to have that. She wanted it to be more home-like. She wanted it to be a place that people could feel they were respected and treated with dignity and that they would be able to manage their own crisis. And so that's sort of how we took it from there. Um, knowing that poverty is the biggest issue people with mental health have to deal with all, in a lot of times. Uh, once you get a major diagnosis of a major, a diagnosis of a major mental illness, if you don't have financial support from a family, then you're going to be going, you're not going to be able to work, um, you're not going to be able to find jobs, so you're going to be on some kind of public assistance, and that means you're going to be living in poverty, and all those poverty issues will impact your mental health even worse. Um, so that's what we felt we had to deal with. We had to deal with the circumstances around their lives that were impacting their ability to function, and so we just looked at doing things that way. And uh, so we don't have a big board with all the names on it. We do have a board in the staff office at the back that has what rooms people are in, uh, their medication and whatever they're taking they're responsible for while they're here. They're adults. They live in, on their own when they're not here. So you give them that responsibility. And while they're here, they don't have to check in every two minutes with staff. They We expect them to continue on with their life, whatever that might be, if they're going to park every day, then that's fine. They go to park every day. If they have jobs, they can do that. Um, if they have other appointments or meetings that they go to, then that's what they should be doing, and we'll help them with that. And if there's uh, making a plan in terms of what their crisis is and what they want to do to resolve it, we'll help them around that as well, making referrals, etc. So it's simple. You know, let people take care of themselves. And when they can't, you give them some guidance in terms of how they can do that. So why this location? This? Yeah. It was the police staff house, and Reba knew about it because she had been on the police services board, and she knew it was empty. Right. She, she was driving she by one in. day. She was driving by one day. She said, hmm, that would be nice. So she made a couple of phone calls, and uh, then Mary Lou got on it. You know Mary Lou? No. 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 Uh, she's a pretty strong woman, um, a lawyer who, now she was with, who was she with? Uh, Ontario Human Rights for a while and a number of other things and she was big with the Women's College Hospital uh, making sure that it stayed Women's College Hospital um, so she's she's a dynamite woman mm -hmm. and uh, she was she made sure that we got this this site 
and then uh, she actually, before the ministry approved the funding, she had a contract to, to start up, um, do the construction and, and renovations and uh, rent it. So, because the ministry had said they're going to give her the money, so okay, fine, then we're going ahead. And away we went. And, so the ministry, Whoa. <laughs> but, and now yeah. you have a branch plant. A branch plant, yeah. Well, we have a, a small place. <laughs> and that's it? Um, it's at Dufferin and Bloor? Yeah, approximately. It's between Dovercourt and Dufferin on Bloor. On the south side, there's a church there. Do you know that area? I live in that area. Oh, good. Um, there's, do you know... Yeah, there's a big church. I think it's Catholic. The Catholic, Catholic church on the south side, and we're just sort of a little bit west of there. Oh, okay. It's a gray brick face. has no sign on it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Obviously, no sign. So I'll, I'll take note. No, I live on Havelock, so it's just... Oh, right. yeah, you're right around the corner. Yeah, we're just around there. We'd probably give you a leaflet if you're near the near Bloor Street. Yeah, we probably got a leaf. Yeah. Saying that we're yeah. going to do it. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, and it's good. It's um, It's been great because people can stay there longer. Even though it's smaller space, uh, in some ways it's better space for the people that are staying there. It's just the common areas aren't quite as big. Um, but they're there for 30 or 40 days, so they have their own room. And uh, most of the time people are out during the day. They have other things they're looking to do. And, and uh, so it's been, it's been really actually interesting. And when did that open? About two years ago, October, right. or be three years this October. So, and, and it's for men and women? Yeah. And, but the, the, the thing is that there are um, men and women who have had some kind of contact with a... Well, there are nine beds for men and women who have had conflict with the law and mm -hmm. have mental health issues. And there's five beds for women only who have uh, who are homeless and have mental health issues. Right, okay. That was because I, because I actually, at one point, I thought it was just for women. Yeah. It must have been that reference to those separate bed, those okay. beds that were yeah. allocated for women. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And it, is the model used elsewhere? Like, is, it's, it, this sounds like a real success story, right? Um, <laughs> the model is not used elsewhere. It's similar. Things have, create, have been created, and a lot of people... Um, I interviewed a guy the other day who said that the Gerstein Center is the, the, uh, the grandfather of... Uh, of crisis beds in the province, but the, mostly of the crisis beds aren't exactly the same. Um, similar but not the same. I think uh, it's mostly around the people that are doing the job that makes the difference and the, when you get a lot of um, sort of people more worried about uh, their liability than about what they're doing to help people. Then they put too many rules in place, and you wind up not necessarily giving people the help that they need. I also think it's kind of interesting that so many of these these people actually don't have <clears throat> appropriate training, right? So mm -hmm. you don't you don't come in with uh, with a plan. Yeah. You just come in and you just are. Yeah. And well, that could be actually a very good thing. But here. I mean, Victor was one of the first people we hired. Oh, yeah, your dad worked here. Yeah. Yes. Worked here for about five years, six years, I guess. Like yeah. Before yeah. we managed to mm -hmm. make sure we eating the food at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, was, he would be here. He'd cook all night when he worked nights. He worked nights. Well, well you guys were young. He was mm -hmm. working nights here. So, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, no, we hired a, a very eclectic group uh, of people. Uh, everything from somebody who had only a grade six education, had her own mental health issues and lots of experience working in shelter system um, to uh, somebody that had his uh, his master's and we now have somebody who has a PhD who works for us. But I mean, it's, it's an eclectic group. Um, we even have some social workers that we've hired, reluctantly, but we've hired them. <laughs> um, so it's people with a background that have worked in the field somewhere for four or five years, have been working with people that have um, have mental health issues and having little backup or support and a good, really good knowledge of community resources and, and open attitudes towards people. Mm -hmm. so, mostly about good attitudes around people and accepting their differences. So you've been in the field, I'm just counting on my fingers, for like 20, is it 20 years? 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. Yeah. So what's your feeling for changes? I'm a bit good. of a cynic. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can talk about recovery if you want. <coughs> you can talk about the commission if you want to. The Mental Health Commission? Yes. And that little project? Mm. Um, let me talk about that. Well, I, I, I sit on a committee uh, that's, uh, uh, what is it called? Service Working Group that's working with the project, so I'm, at least we're aware of it. Uh, the people that are going into these, these places are going to need crisis support, so part of my job is to make sure that we are aware of what's going on and what's happening with it. Um, I think everyone that's involved in it and has taken the money to provide the services for this St. Mike's research project are almost all reluctant to take it but felt that this was an opportunity to get some housing for people, so let's get the housing and let's support them and let's see what we can do to, the, to help these them out. These are these um, demonstration projects that the commission This is, is a research project that they're doing across Canada. Uh, they're doing it in Toronto with St. Mike's Hospital, and the psychiatrist involved in it, Vicki uh, Stergiopoulos, is great, uh, so that's good. Um, Toronto North Support Services, um, Cross boundaries and CODA has an ACT team that's involved with it. So they're trying three different kinds of case management support. They're finding housing for them. That's a thousand dollar a month housing. They're getting and the ones that win the lottery and get chosen to be part of this project. So you apply to be part of the project. Two people go in. One gets housing with subsidies and uh, supports. The other gets what they're calling service as usual which means that they would be connected with a case management program somewhere and then they would try and find them housing and get them a place to, to stay uh, and then work with them. So the ones that win the lottery and get the subsidized unit in a place they pick. So I want a, how, I want an apartment in Parkdale. They'll find you one. They have one guy that's job is to find housing for people. Not only will they find you that apartment, they have money to buy furniture for the apartment. So you get this new apartment with new furniture and you move in and you have this people supporting you. Um, Do they really need a study to figure out? Yeah, yeah, see? That would, that, that's the question that's asked by everyone. And, and um, just think how much housing they could provide if they put all the money instead of study. But anyways, yes, that's what my, I have a colleague who's shadowing the commission. Um, and that's was her point. Well, yeah. It's, it, when I brought it up at staff meeting that this project was going on, um, they, they all looked at me and they went, they need a study for this? And they're doing it across Canada and it's lots of money. So the organizations have, have said that they will do this and they're going to go and work with it. Um, Toronto North Support Services is doing both the, the study part where they get the, the money and the service as usual, so they're providing both pieces of that. So there's, there's that. And Cross Boundaries is, uh, you know Cross Boundaries? Yeah. It's a, a multicultural um, mental health services and they, they do, uh, they have a good case management program and they work with, with a lot of individuals from new, newcomers to Canada, mm -hmm. uh, from other cultures and um, it, it's sort of the only game in town for that. Um, so, but they're, they're doing a good job with it too. But it's, it's sort of like, okay, so four years people get housing and they get money and subsidies. What happens after that? So everyone's hoping that it will continue on after, but there's no guarantee because it's the Senate and it's federal money. And will they keep it coming? I don't know. So we're just there keeping an eye on the crisis piece and trying to help. Uh, if they get somebody that needs housing, they can stay here for a couple of days while they wait to get into the housing and we'll work with them on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems silly. Yes, it is. Especially when there are other studies in other countries and all around the state that works, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, is there, um, is there any uh, thing that we've, I have no idea how long we've been keeping you, but um, is there, is there a, a, anything else that you wanted to, that you felt like I've, we haven't covered that's important? Or just... I think when, when, I, was at, when I was at Park, there was a lot of optimism. I mean, things started to move forward. Uh, the uh, Sport Housing Coalition was in place. Um, housing was on the agenda in terms of, uh, of a place to start to get people support and get them out. If you start there, then you can provide other things around that. Um, and then when Harris came in, all that died. It just, it was just like axed. And 
uh, social services in general got absolutely no increase in their budgets, which for salaries, bad enough, but when it's uh, everything else combined, then and inflation kept going, so you lost a lot of programs, lost staff, lost parts of the program that they were doing. There were so many places that provided after-hour support for people, and they stopped uh, and just left our number on their answering machine, so if people needed support, they could call us. So there was a lot of that happened, and, and I think it, it was very depressing. And uh, it seems to have gotten a little bit better, but it's now moving so far to the medical model piece that that's a little frightening. Because um, the medical model has never really solved mental health. And with the lens, they're doing everything in straight lines. I mean, I was at a, a group that was looking at sort of how people got into the system. Well, they, they start at A, they go to B, and they branch it off to C and D, and then they branch it off to, you know. And I was looking at the board. They had a big whiteboard in the, the meeting room I was at, and they had clearly been doing some uh, strategic planning. And strategic planning, the way people are doing it these days, they sort of have circles and narrows, and they try to show all the interconnectedness and how messy it is. Well, I was looking at it, and I was sitting beside a woman who's vice president at, uh, at CAMH, and we looked at it, and we looked at the straight lines, and then we looked at the thing on the wall, and we went, that's mental health. That's how people interact with the mental health system. It's all over the place, and it's wherever you can get in and wherever you can get to somebody to help them. It's not these straight lines where everything's neat and clean in a little box. If you don't fit that box, you move to another box. But they're doing that. Yeah, I guess when you were at Park was when <clears throat> when on our own was still going, still going. Phoenix when, Rising when was Phoenix still there. Phoenix Rising was on the map. Yeah. Um, when the Mad Market was happening, yeah. um, that must have been a time of optimism. Yeah, and Pat was doing her her uh, little paper, the Cuckoo's Nest, out of Park. And there was a bunch of other little things going on that were. It was a really active. Um, survivor group and each, I mean, Don Weitz was doing his thing and Pat was doing her thing and they were different things but they were still fighting at the system and, and going at it and there was there was some vibrancy there um, and I think the ministry saw how to get around that by funding places like uh, Away and uh, you know Fresh Start and uh, OCAP, all good things um, but it put a lot of the leaders into those positions where they're running an organization and have to manage that and have to deal with Ministry of Health funding and um, so less time on their hands to, you know, Actually. rattle rouse. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Good things. They're all good projects. And I think OCAB is just starting to come out of uh, where it was and into more of an advocacy and uh, um, role right. in that. And, uh, you, know, you don't see much from Fresh Start in terms of that. They're too busy doing business. And uh, Away, a little more with Lori there. So there's a little more of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You need shit to servers. Lots of them. And the system needs to move along. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that was great. Thank you okay. very much. No, you're welcome. And we didn't ask about the basement.